I am going to start with Rahana. <laughs> Rahana Natu. Um, Rahana is the founder and CEO of Spectrum Impact, a strategy consulting firm that supports a range of organizations looking to expand their impact investment footprint. Um, Rahana has held numerous leadership roles in this space, um, the Impact Investing Program at the Case Foundation, Bank of New York Mellon Social Finance Program, the Rockefeller Foundation, um, and UN Capital Development Fund work as well. And Rahana is an adjunct assistant professor with, within Georgetown University's Global Development Program, teaching impact investing, social finance in emerging markets, and we are honored to have you here today. Okay, and next we have Rachel Robashoti. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Rachel is the CEO and founder of Adesina Social Capital. It's an investment firm that serves as a critical bridge between the social justice movement and financial movements. We love that. Uh, Rachel is a leader in the financial industry, and she's known for integrating social justice criteria into investment portfolios, uh, working tirelessly and consciously at the intersection of racial, gender, economic, and climate justice. Um, she's also the co-creator of Due Diligence uh, 2.0, which is a, an organization that is um, trying to transform, transform the way the industry um, supports asset managers, particularly asset managers who are people of color. Um, Rachel's passion for social justice is rooted in her background as a black queer woman growing up in a community that struggled for safety and financial security um, in a town that was largely segregated, and we're happy to have her voice on the panel today. NECA is our next panelist, NECA Ize. Um, NECA is a managing partner and general partner at Vested World. It's an African-focused venture capital firm investing in agriculture and consumer goods, um, and also specifically investing in early stage companies and uh, technology startups in East and West Africa. Um, I think you guys are up to 32 companies uh, to date, um, which is wonderful. Um, NECA has a deep well of experience and knowledge in African consumers in both rural and urban areas, um, and she's been working thoughtfully um, on the continent for, I think, close to 14 years maybe now. Um, NECA has led transactions in uh, creative industries, B2B, retail tech, fintech, health tech, mobility, and logistics. Um, she's rooted in a frame of reference um, for black feminism and brings an understanding of race and class and gender um, when it comes to capital and economic growth. And we're happy to have you here. So these are our wonderful panelists. And I think when it comes to gender lens investing, um, I'd like to set the stage by us defining that. Um, and so the first question I have is, how do you define uh, gender lens investing? And I'd like each of our panelists to take that. How do you define it? And how does it show up in the work that you do? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So nice to be here. Thank you, Ashley, for, for organizing this conversation. So as you sort of mentioned in the introduction, my firm specifically works with allocators. So we focus on investors who are deploying capital, have market rate expectations, are impact interested, and completely confused. That's our sweet spot. The more confused you are, the happier we are. Because it means we get to start at the beginning. We get to throw out all of the misconceptions and preconceived notions that we all bring to this space and start with data, which Rachel will talk a lot about because her firm does an incredibly like thoughtful data forward approach to investing. But we start with data, we start with performance, and we start with objective and impact. Um, and so in that, in that sort of uh, idea of education and moving together, which is very much a firm principle, we talk a lot about um, gender or racial equity or really any impact theme um, as a way of thinking about your risk and opportunity holistically. And we use that language because for so many folks that are new to the space, the moral imperative even though it's how we are designed, is unbelievably frightening. And it can actually be very segregating in a way. So someone sort of walks in and says, well, if I'm not doing this already, what have you decided about whether I care about women or girls or non-binary people? And so we come at it the other way, and we start with the risk imperative. And so for us, gender lens investing is, how are you thinking about half of the population, half of the labor force, and half of, half of the best ideas in the world? 
Are you looking for them? Are you thinking about them? Are you accounting for them? Are you missing them? And so for us, gender lens investing comes into the investment discovery process. Where do women and girls live in the way you make decisions? And how do you support women and girls as customers, consumers, and investors? So we take a very operations focused, given what we do. So at Adesina Social Capital, we're a public markets impact asset manager, and we specialize in social justice investing. What that actually means is that we partner with social justice movements to understand what impact means. There's a lot of uh, folks in finance who are talking to each other about data we already have in order to impact um, yeah, the, the issues. I hear some laughs because it's true. Um, and what we do is listen to the community that we intend to impact. So during the Me Too movement, we went to the gender justice community and said, what is it that you would have us do? So for us, the definition is getting out of our own finance box and talking to those who are impacted. They said, you know, we, you know, we talked to the um, National Women's Law Center, we talked to women's foundations across the country and survivor groups of workplace sexual harassment, and they told us, can you get rid of forced arbitration for sexual harassment? There wasn't any data available at that point about which companies had these policies in place that would shelter the company and the perpetrator, silence the victim, allow this um, serial sexual harassment to continue. The trouble with the way that public markets and finance were approaching it before that point is that, again, looking around data, looking around with data that we already have, a lot of gender lens portfolios were being created based on women on boards. Extremely important. At Adesina, we believe that safe and inclusive workplaces in society are absolutely necessary for women and gender expansive people and the issue that was being presented and what we were asked to do was to put an end to a, a practice that was enabling serial sexual harassment. So that's what we focused on and when we didn't have the data, we went out and created it in partnership with social justice organizations. So there's about 3,600 publicly traded companies that are listed in the United States where this would apply and we built a database that was public that would show the status of a company and where it stood on this policy. So for us, the definition is really rooted in what does the gender justice community, those organizations that are led by and doing work on behalf of women and gender expansive people, what is it that they need us to do? So it's kind of a constantly evolving definition. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, everyone, for the reflections. We invest in the private side of things. And one of the things that I noted when I joined Vested World a few years ago was that um, our portfolio did have a number of female founders in it. Um, you know, we're investing in Africa. Uh, most of the female founders were foreign. And I, you know, said uh, this is, could be a challenge or problem or want to understand how we got here. Um, and we had to really look internally and reflect on why that was and what it really meant to invest with a more intersectional lens even as we invest on the continent. Um, but I think maybe the founding of Vested World is also really important. So our founder, Euler, my co-GP, uh, was born and raised in Liberia and moved to the US as a refugee in the early 90s during the Civil War. I think for him, there was this question about what does this mean to have now great access to opportunity that many people back home don't have, and how might he address this opportunity gap over the course of his career? Um, he ended up spending time in Asia and was very inspired by the growth trajectory that he saw there. And that's really what formed the foundation of our thesis, which is that we need to invest uh, really to create the next East Asia in Africa. That our metrics, which are very similar to the way East Asia was uh, about 30, 40 years ago, could improve by investing in a range of sectors to drive inclusive jobs and inclusive job growth. Um, you can't do that without investing in women. It's been really clearly shown on the continent that women are really the job creators because they are the primary entrepreneurs. 
SMEs are the primary creators of jobs on the continent, and so if you have a strategy that's focused on job creation that doesn't take that into account, you're really not going to lead to job growth. Um, there's been a lot of research around what does gender lens investing mean in the private markets, and many of you will be aware of the 2x challenge and some of the metrics and work that they've done there. Um, there's a broader set of things, but I'd say number one that we try and look at is uh, do you have female founders in the you know, group of founders, yes or no? Um, you obviously want to look at the supply chain and the customers that are being actually served. But one of the things we said was that we know that companies that have female founders are more likely to, um, I'd say, address some of the challenges that we see in the broader sector that might be around sexual harassment policies or family leave policies or otherwise. Um, so that's one of the metrics that we really track. But earlier this year, we said, um, is that enough to just have a female founder, or does the power structure actually make sense? Uh, and by that, I mean one of our portfolio companies has fa four founders, and one founder has about 45% share. There is a female founder. She has about 15%. Another founder has 15%. So while her share is similar to the other you know, non-majority male founder or almost majority male founder, should we count that as a yes or not? And so we've recently started to define this as what's the actual percent equity ownership as a female founder that you have in the company, and then we count that share as a yes. So in that case, it's 15% yes. And then in another case, that's a solo female-founded company, that would be 100% yes. I think getting deeper into this, it's really the question of who's making decisions in a company, and who's being served, and how are they being served? How are employees being treated in an organization, and how are they growing in that organization? And then how are you operating sort of with the broader community? So there's a few sets of areas you can try and look at. It's not so easy, um, but I think there's metrics, and then there's what you're really trying to get at when you look at uh, gender lens investing. Okay, thank you. I appreciate all of those perspectives. One of the things that, from what you just said, Neko, you were talking about the importance of um, sort of investing um, in these companies and how that can help with job creation. I wonder if you can speak to, um, you know, why this particular lens is important. Like, what would happen in the absence of not prioritizing it and not thinking about it? Do you have another example that you might be able to share with us? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think one of the questions is where is capital actually flowing and why or why is it not flowing there? Um, just some context in Africa, uh, female only founded teams are getting 2.2% or less of venture capital dollars. Uh, if you have a blended male female founded team, they're getting about 17% of venture capital dollars. What that means is less than 20% of VC in Africa is going to women. As I mentioned, women are the key entrepreneurs uh, at all levels in my view. Um, so there's a pretty big gap. Um, I think what it ends up meaning is that broadly the investing ecosystem is uh, biased in a lot of ways and is leaving uh, ROI for our investors on the table by not investing in women. We've seen this show up as we like to lead rounds. There is a company we invested in called Shuttlers. Uh, it was a bootstrapped female-founded company. And the perspective from some VCs was that this is not venture scalable. Um, and whether it was that they couldn't see what we saw or that they really liked this other very loud <laughs> company uh, you know, that had raised quite a bit of money uh, but had much less traction. Um, I'm not sure, but that company, Shuttlers, uh, grew 26x over a period of 18 months in terms of the number of routes uh, and raised a pre-Series A round earlier this year. And I think it is really about leaving money on the table. It's about undervaluing and misjudging women. And it's really about saying that um, we shouldn't invest in women is sort of the, the view that I was getting from some of this, oh, is it venture scalable? Meaning maybe the founder isn't 
the one that should be getting this capital. Um, they've created hundreds of jobs in the mobility space in Nigeria, um, and through their bus partners are moving 9,000 people per day in Nigeria, and I think the impact they're having is not just on the jobs, but also on the fact that women are safer taking this transport than they are in public transportation. And there are many other impacts that sort of ripple from that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Rachel, are you seeing anything specific in this space, especially when it comes to intersectionality and like the social justice frameworks? Like, you know, what do you think would happen in the absence of, of putting that kind of lens toward investment? Is it on? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in public markets, we've done a great job of having capital flow seamlessly, but it's become relatively disconnected from the impacts of that capital. So I believe that in it's on the private side, it is absolutely imperative to invest in women and invest in solutions that are supportive of women and gender expansive people. On the public market side, what we're more um, at risk of, if you're looking at the business case, is the headline risk or the, you know, you're the company that had a serial sexual harassment, you know, set of claims. Um, you're also looking at the ability to retain talent. Um, when forced arbitration for sexual harassment existed, um, we were looking at multiple studies showing that where the policies existed, they were really having trouble retaining talent over time, which is becoming increasingly important in a tight job market. So there's a business case for it. From a social justice perspective, one of the reasons we chose to focus on this issue is because forced arbitration disproportionately um, impacted low-wage workers, women, and African-American workers in the United States. So we could actually, from an intersectional perspective, get a lot of impact for focusing on this particular issue. Thank you, that's really important. I don't know if, um, Rahana, you have an example that might be separate from that, but I'm hearing, you know, money's being left on the table, people can be, you know, um, kind of sidelined. Um, is there anything else you might wanna add? Yeah, I think both Nika and, and Rachel really perfectly articulated the defensive, I'm, I'm simplifying, oversimplifying, but the defensive and offensive opportunities of gender lens investing, and there are plenty. I think the third thing that we see in our client base, which as I mentioned is, is investors predominantly, um, is, is really just this idea about business model continuity also. So there is something that has happened, particularly historically in the United States, where we have we moved from a traditional philosophy of workers as value adders to a cost center, and we changed what it means to be an employer and an employee. There's not a company on the planet that does not require either natural resources or labor to fuel the bottom line. We are on the precipice of AI and technology, so maybe I'm not saying that next year, but currently, you need one of those two things to have a really great year. And so thinking about your workers as a stakeholder in the process is a thing that we've lost, I think, with the current system that we operate in. So I would say in, in addition to those wonderful examples, to me, there's some serious business model risk. Rachel talked about retention. Um, turnover costs are astronomical in this country, and it's kind of amazing what you could do if you provided childcare or if you simply provided more than four weeks of unpaid, your job is kind of cool, protection when you're walking out the door. I mean, it's really just amazing that those feel superfluous when they are directly relevant to the success of a business. So for some of our clients, I think in addition to what has been shared, which is exactly right, there is this very sort of like um, new way of thinking about who is actually adding to the business, who's creating value for you, and then how are you creating value for them? Thank you, that's a really great perspective. I think what's interesting is that we were talking about, you know, why this kind of lens is important, what's at risk if we don't prioritize this. But you guys know from any perspective, whenever you're giving or receiving money, you're gonna draw critique mm -hmm. and you're gonna draw criticism if you're on the side of being the person who's receiving the funding, being on the side of the person who's allocating the funding. And I wonder if you can speak to some of the challenge in that, uh, you know, maybe, how do you respond to 
skepticism in this space, um, direct critique in this space, and feel free to share you know, a, a general view or a specific example if you have, have something. Um, and this is for all the panelists, so uh, you know, just popcorn and, and hop right. in. So we had uh, many people, when Adesina started, we had many people say, uh, it's not possible to drive impact in public markets. And what we were able to show, this was our proof of concept, we work on issues beyond the gender forward issues as well, but this was our proof of concept. Um, we were central to ending forced arbitration for sexual harassment in this country last year by building investor support, by publishing a database. Um, and when we started, there were less than 20 companies that had publicly ended the practice. When we ended, there were 396 companies that represented 10 million workers. We patted ourselves on the back. We felt pretty good about that. Thought that was good impact. Um, but then we start. We were winding down because uh, legislation was coming forward, and we began to consult at the highest levels of policymaking on what would ultimately become uh, a bill that would uh, one of the few bipartisan bills that would pass to end forced arbitration. Uh, for sexual harassment in the country. So a lot of our naysayers were just like, this isn't possible in public markets. And what we said was there's power behind data, there's power in working in communities, so extending our impact well beyond our own portfolio to mobilize other investors, that's like our approach to impact. Um, so the, it was for us it was really more like a disbelief that impact was possible in public markets, and it absolutely is. Um, if you're looking beyond your own portfolio. Um, I would also say, and I, I feel very sensitively about this as well, um, I do have people that say, how can you be invested in public markets at all? Um, and I can have one foot very clearly in our vision of a regenerative future, but I also have to have the other foot squarely in the present. Money is power in this world and in this country, and most of it, most of our collective resources are in public markets. Someone has to do what's necessary to put those collective resources toward our solving our biggest problems, and that's what we're up to. Yeah, I would just uh, say it's an ongoing debate in the African VC and ecosystem. Um, you get a lot of pushback. I think you can just check any of, <laughs> search my name on Twitter and gender or Aloho Omame from First Check Capital and just see the various responses <laughs> is what I would say. I try not to engage too much on Twitter, so maybe every other month I'll you know put something out there. But um, I think the biggest uh, critique, if you will, is that, um, oh, there's not enough female founders to invest in in Africa. Um, and it's an interesting, vicious cycle because of that you know, 20% or so of capital that's going to female founders, um, meaning male, female founding teams or female only, uh, almost 80% of that is at the seed and pre-seed. And so you can imagine that to then get to a Series A is quite challenging and there's a huge drop off that's happening. Um, and so I think there is this challenge around actually making bets that are bigger bets than you know a 50K check. So who's getting the tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars? Um, so I think that's probably the biggest critique, if you will. I think the other one is that, um, and the data is starting to come now. There's a few great data sources for African VC, but that we're still relatively early in terms of venture capital. Um, so my firm was founded in 2014 doing deal by deal investments and then the first fund was launched um, about five years ago. Most VC funds on the continent were launched around 2013, 2014. So we're just getting this first 10 year data. Um, and there's for now uh, only one fund that's fully exited its first fund. And so we're still relatively early. Um, my hope is that the data will continue to show 
uh, what we know from every other market in the world that has this data, uh, which is that you are leaving money on the table by not investing in female founders, by not inverse, investing in diverse management teams, by not setting up boards of directors that have diversity on them, by not looking at the supply chain, by not looking at policy, et cetera. So I think um, people are allowed to be a little bit ignorant in the absence of data, and my hope is that as we are building this practice on the continent, um, the data will prove out as it literally has in every other market. Rahana, I wonder if you could also tap in a little bit maybe to kind of sometimes there's, you know, there's critique coming from traditional investors as well, you know, in terms of like what it means to look at the quote unquote non-financial you know, kind of factors as a lens for investment, and if you can also add to that. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's a really important framing. I think that the criticism around gender lens investing is not at all dissimilar to criticism around any values-based judgment, and I think it's a uniquely human experience to take a really complex thing and simplify it to obsolescence. Like, we just can't handle, we're not very good in the gray, we're terrible at it. And so criticisms around gender or climate or racial equity, any of these impact themes, they often lack materiality. And materiality is an unbelievably unattractive conversation to have in any financial consideration because what it basically means is here's an asterisk and nobody loves that. And so we spend a lot of time reminding our clients that an investor that is looking at an Adesina product and an investor that's looking at a vested world product might be the same investor, but what they have to consider material to that strategy is drastically different. That gender in the public markets and gender in the private markets don't look the same. That a founder-led strategy in a continent that's particularly underinvested is really strong. And a founder-led strategy in a market in a developed economy may not be that exciting. And so being able to bring a material perspective to your work, what's relevant for me in this market, in this place, in this asset class, and with these constraints, that is what we try and do with our investors. And it, it just adds complexity. And so it gets really hard for an investor to say, well, here's our gender lens methodology. Because like any other impact theme, it's not one methodology. It's a different approach to every single asset class. And so trying to build just a little patience and tolerance. You know, no traditional investor in the world takes the same approach to their entire portfolio. So neither should we. And trying to remind ourselves the patience and the grace and I think the comfortability with complexity that we need to actually get it done. Yeah, I think that's powerful. We live in the gray every day. Um, so, yeah. you know, we live in the gray with all of our issues and also just life in general. I am curious, I kind of just want to get a little sense of the room. How many founders might we have in here? Okay, do we have any investors in the room? Okay, um, people who would describe themselves as social entrepreneurs? All right, wonderful. Okay, so the reason I asked that is because I kind of want to take us to the point of, I'm not gonna say advice, but, <laughs> I'm not gonna say advice per se, but like, if someone wants to get started in this space, you know, I want to think about gender lens investing um, as a part of what I do, um, as a part of conversations. Like, just what would be your guidepost? What would be one guidepost that you could point someone um, toward, whether that person's a social entrepreneur or a founder or an investor, um, if you can give a thought? I think it's really important to clarify what your goals are. And the goal that is the least likely to offend is a goal centered on fairness. So if you are on the investment committee of a foundation that wants to move more um, in the direction of racial, gender, economic, climate justice, you can have this argument that says, why aren't our fund managers reflecting the demographics of the country? You know, if the country's 51% women, why aren't our managers reflecting that? The reason it's easier is because that's a value that tends to be shared on the left and right, is the value of fairness. So I think that's one thing that you can do to like move the conversation forward. Another thing that can happen um, is ensuring that it's something that you're doing in community. 
because you're best learning, knowing what's coming up and what's on the cutting edge is going to be from the other people who are working in the space. Um, I want to invite anyone to join our newsletter. Um, if you text the word justice to 55444, you can become part of the Addisina community, follow what's happening. We have some very exciting things that we're going to be doing related to data and trans rights. Very interesting what public markets investors can do. But it's also a chance to be part of a community where there's co-learning happening. I would say um, it's a long journey. And so I shared, you know, we started at, OK, just looking at the portfolio founders, I think there is an issue here uh, on joining to how do we really think about the power dynamics in the data that we're collecting. Um, so I think just be ready for that journey and fully embrace it. Um, I think it's important to understand your own individual biases as you're going to lead the charge, if you will. Um, but also start to understand them within the organization. Uh, so I remember after some trainings around what this intersectional metrics might look like for our fund, um, there was some reflection <laughs> around, oh, it's going to be really challenging to look at both the return expectations and the gender and, and, and. And it's just like, uh, OK, <laughs> do you want to invest to, to have the greatest returns or, or not uh, and greatest impact? Um, and then I think there's uh, another piece, which is just um, take that time to reflect on the journey and share it and bring others with you. Uh, make some challenging choices, which might include your investing team and what's the makeup of that team Two-thirds of my investing team are women. I think that was not the case two years ago. And we've been very intentional in how we're thinking about hiring and why we're hiring in this way. Um, it's not an easy journey <laughs> by any means. But um, share and be in community uh, is a great idea from Rachel as well. Maybe I would just, those are fantastic. I would just add to that maybe quite specifically to the investor or decision maker um, part of the audience. Knowing thyself is more than just knowing what kind of change you want to see in the world. Um, and having a really good sense of your expectations will provide folks like these wonderful ladies an opportunity to really meet your needs. And so we tell investors all the time, if you don't have high risk tolerance with your capital, that's OK. We will find something amazing that does not require you to move outside of your investment comfort zone. If you don't have 25 years to prove this concept, that's OK. We will find something where you have contributed to the cause in three to five years. And so I think for investors, they, there's this impression that you have, to, you have to shoot for the moon to contribute at all to this movement. And I just don't think that's what we've learned. We've learned that in a lot of ways, moving together in whatever way you're comfortable with actually moves us farther. And so for, for the investors and the decision makers, I think, approaching this space, it's OK to have um, fine, bright lines about what kind of capital, what kind of movement, what kind of places you can invest in. And there will be a gender solution for you. Thank you. I think that's all great advice. Um, so I wonder, do we have any questions from the audience? It might be a great time to take, take some. Does anyone have a question? Ooh, it's a quiet room. <laughs> this means we covered all of the topics <laughs> perfectly. Oh. <laughs> oh, wait, I think we have one there. Yeah? who are sort of new to investing but really believe in all the principles that you talked about? I, we, our product is, um, our investment product is an exchange traded fund, trades for about $17 per share. The ticker symbol is JSTC. One of the most important things that we did was democratize access to what we're doing. So, you know, start with a global, all cap, very diversified exchange traded fund. 
My suggestion. <laughs> Maybe I would just add to that that um, uh, this is going to sound superfluous. It's not meant to be. Um, take a peek at what you've got. Um, there used to be, I'm going to say like five or six years ago, there was this movement for um, retail investors to start to lobby um, plan administrators, so the vanguards, the fidelities, the Schwabs of the world, and, and somehow magically convince them uh, that we were all going to strike together, and then in exchange, you have to do ESG. It was a, it was a dream. It was a, it was a dream and a goal, and the industry is sort of disincentivized to allow that sort of collective action. But what it did do was create a market imperative that people were not willing to stay with plan administrators that didn't at least have an ESG product. Now, are the ESG products very good? No. Um, do you need to invest with folks like Adesina? Yes. So there are, I think, options out there, but the looking, the just taking a peek and seeing what you have, I think that there's incredible strength in that. Maybe it doesn't feel like an allocation to start, but it's, it's a great step along the journey, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, um, I think it's very powerful to have a group of friends uh, intentionally investing in this space. And we've seen a few examples where this can actually lead to pretty significant impacts. Um, I was sadly not involved in this, but a wonderful call, former colleague was. Um, in West Africa, the Women's Investment Club was actually started at a Women's Day event uh, about five years ago, where there were maybe as many of us in a room saying, hey, let's talk about women and whatever. And the women said, let us put our money in. And they were able to raise about $3 million from these you know, amazing Senegalese women in industry. And they invested in public markets to start and then have actually launched an evergreen fund out of that. Um, so I think there can be some really impressive power by coming together. Um, even in the context that, unfortunately, women are not investing as much into public markets and perhaps um, asset owners will need to make a bigger change to actually have the impact we'd all like to see. Thank you. I think those were great questions. Does anyone else have a question in the room? Yes. <laughs> Uh, based on your experience, whether there's a particular sector that uh, you have found to be more uh, open or amenable to gender lens investing, and by that I mean, you know, climate change versus health versus other areas um, where either investors uh, themselves have been able to more seamlessly recognize that there is uh, a value in terms of a social return on investment as well as uh, a financial return on investment. I've been really encouraged and to see the overlap between racial and gender justice conversations that's happened in the past several years. I think the Me Too movement and the racial justice reckoning in uh, 2020 were both happened in relatively close proximity where investors started to see that social justice movements are giving us some early indicators of risk that we might not otherwise get signals for. In that, I believe there was a lot of intentionality um, in spaces, I'm thinking of Gender Smart, um, which is now 2X, and you know many different initiatives that were about lifting up the work of women of color and looking at the challenges at the intersection of racial and gender justice. The more we do that, I think the better off we are all going to be because we're looking to solve the problem of having valued some humans more than others. And you can do that by race. You can do that by gender, you can do that by class. And I think the more that we, um, the more that we come together to reweave the fabric of our shared humanity in our investing, the better off we'll be. Yeah, building on that, um, I would say all sectors <laughs> have some potential for gender lens investing. And so it really is a question of what are you actually looking to achieve with the investment? And we're looking at, you know, what I call Africa soft power. And within that, as you all probably know, Afro Beats, uh, you probably know Nollywood now with all these films coming out. And unfortunately, most of the production companies on the continent are actually not really 
getting significant revenue back to them. So the largest music studio in Nigeria is probably about somewhere between three to $5 million in annual revenue, um, which is crazy given all you know Afrobeats. Um, and so there's a question about how can you actually bring value back to the continent across music, fashion, film, et cetera. Um, many creative industry businesses are female-led and female-founded, and so it's an area that I'm particularly excited about. But I'm also incredibly excited about, about B2B retail tech and agri or um, financial services, financial technology. So I think it's hard to say that there's going to be one sector, and uh, especially given what I mentioned, the metrics around where investment is happening, what could end up happening if you say, okay, we're gonna only invest in female founders and creative is that um, you end up with 90% of FinTech deals being male founded. So I would say everything can be gender lens in a way, like every sector has the potential to have a gender lens deal in it. Um, but doing that work to really understand the opportunities is important. Maybe I'll just, I loved that, and maybe I'll just underline something that Neka said, which is that that it is possible across all asset classes and, and sectors. Um, we've certainly found that with our clients. They'll, many clients will walk in and say, we want to do gender lens investing, so we know that it has to be in VC. And we spend time with them to explain there's actually a way that gender is not an asset class, so there is a way to have gender across the whole portfolio. But if you can't, then it can live in the investment process. And it's not an or, it's an and. And so for some of our clients, they haven't had the opportunity to do really cool stuff in South America in waste and sanitation that predominantly impacts women. They're not in the right type of capital and time horizon for that to happen. But for the investments they're making in the Rust Belt in the United States, they can start to ask questions about how many women are in your workforce? What is the pay discrepancy between your highest compensated employee and your lowest? Are their genders the same? Are their genders different? What do you do around sexual harassment? A lot of the stuff that Nika and Rachel both work on. So building it into the investment process, uh, it's less fun to talk about, but I think that's actually where we've seen the highest impact. It doesn't stop the dollars from flowing, but it does start to remind people that gender is a choice you can make in the way you invest, not just in what you invest in. So I loved what you said about it being everywhere, because I think it can be everywhere. That's great. Okay, thank you. I think that's a wonderful question to close on. I just want to say that um, I have a few key takeaways, and I hope you took away a few things as well. One is that this is complex work, but this is important work, um, that the gender lens can be applied intersectionally, and it should be, and that also um, we can take a framework to uh, be grounded in this work and expect that there might be critique, but you can still do the, uh, the investing and you can still push forward a lot of these uh, mission-driven work because it's important work for us to do.